State University. I'm standing in for Dan Otto, who is recovering from surgery. And Dan's public finance class last spring took on the task of preparation for a workshop on the federal deficit organized by today's presenters, the Concord Coalition. The ISU students, along with those from UNI and Iowa, worked out a solution that took into account 30-year projections of health care costs, demographics, and the potential available resources from taxpayers. The ISU students then wrote a Des Moines Register editorial laying out their proposal. One blogger wrote, interesting that a group of college students can present a more comprehensive plan than either the White House or the U.S. Senate. Interesting and depressing. I am also a member of the Ames City Council, so I'm well aware of the limitations of our public servants to solve our problems. And yet I doubt there was a time in history when our politicians failed us more than the recent game of brinksmanship played out over the raising uh, of the debt ceiling. When statesmanship was called for, we played games with the full faith and credit of the government of the United States. As Winston Churchill said, when the eagles are silent, the parrots begin to jabber. And after a month of squawking, a precipitous drop in consumer confidence, and a 1,700-point drop in the Dow, we had an agreement that essentially kicked the can down the road for another 14 months. And so I would like to welcome you to this forum, which aims to address the costs and consequences of our public debt, and to suggest op options for true fiscal reform. We wish to acknowledge all the groups that helped sponsor this forum, the Departments of Economics, Accounting and Finance and Political Science, the College Republicans, the ISU Democrats, the Finance Club, the National Affairs Series on the Nation in Transition, and the Committee on Lectures funded by the government of the student body. Our two speakers are eminently qualified to show us the way out of the swamp. Robert Bixby is executive director of the Concord Coalition, a nonpartisan grassroots organization dedicated to fiscal responsibility. The Concord Coalition was founded in 1992 by former U.S. Senators Warren Redmond, Republican of New Hampshire, and the late Paul Sangas, Democrat of Massachusetts. Prior to his work with the Concord Coalition, Mr. Bixby practiced law and served as the chief staff attorney of the Court of Appeals of Virginia. He has a Juris Doctorate from George Mason University School of Law and a Master's Degree in Public Administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. So welcome, Mr. Bixby. Thank you. The Honorable David Walker is a former U.S. Comptroller General and currently the founder and CEO of the Comeback America Initiative. Mr. Walker was U.S. Comptroller General until 2008, one of his three presidential appointments. He then served as president and CEO of the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, where he worked to promote federal financial responsibility. In 2010, he became president and CEO of the Comeback America Initiative, focused on promoting and achieving specific fiscal solutions. He is also author of the book, Comeback America, Turning the Country Around and Restoring Fiscal Responsibility. So welcome, Mr. Walker. Our moderator tonight, is my colleague in economics and executive vice president and provost of Iowa State University, Elizabeth Hoffman. Betsy holds two doctorates, one in economics from the California Institute of Technology and the other in history from the University of Pennsylvania. As our recent forays into both fiscal and monetary policy are both historic and economic, I can think of no one better equipped to lead this discussion. Provost Hoffman. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, you will all be relieved to know, to learn that tonight's panelists have made a commitment to avoid partisan rhetoric and ideological divides in their discussion. Um, I could put on my historian cap and talk to you about lots of times in our history uh, when there has been um, equally nasty political rhetoric uh, coming out of Washington uh, with some disastrous results. Um, but uh, this is certainly uh, going to go down in history as one that our future generations will remember. They will focus their remarks on positive solutions to our national debt, 
roughly $14.7 trillion right now, and our projected annual deficit in 2011 of $1.4 trillion. So we will not have to endure a reenactment of the recent congressional debt ceiling debate, although if you want to read about a time in history, you could read about Andrew Jackson and his fight with the bank, including a lowering of the nation's long-term credit rating and a, a contentious process. The discussion will also touch upon the impact of politics on the situation always of great interest, especially here in the first in the nation caucus state. We always have the first chance to think about who our next presidential candidates might be. So I'm very happy to welcome to Iowa State two nonpartisan national budget and policy experts to help us think constructively about how to build a stronger economic future, and I wish I'd had them to speak to my public economics class a couple of years ago. We will be discussing a wide range of options, so let's begin with Mr. Bixby. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as we uh, first, let me assure you that uh, neither one of us are running for anything. Uh, always, a, and that would be apparent as soon as you hear what we have to say. I think, <laughs> but it's always good to uh, to come to Iowa at this time because you, if you think about it, uh, you Iowans have a special responsibility and, a, and an opportunity to be the first screeners of presidential candidates. And you're going through that function again this year. And so, uh, you know, we like to visit here. We like to visit uh, New Hampshire. And we're not uh, uh, endorsing or opposing any candidates. But it's more to sort of give a fiscal background check uh, and reality check, which hopefully uh, can help you in, in looking at whether or not the candidates understand the magnitude of the problem, the options for dealing with it, and the urgency of acting sooner rather than later. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, give sort of a general overview of the federal budget, where things stand right now, where things may be trending over the next 10 years, and then Dave will pick it up and talk about some of the consequences of that and talk about some potential solutions, uh, which I would say in advance I, I will agree with what, uh, what he has to say on the subject of solutions. Um, all right, so uh, let's begin with a note of optimism, which is, the title of the chart, the uh, talk, which is that if, uh, if it's always darkest before the dawn, then the sun should be coming up any time now. Okay, so let me go forward. And uh, this is a freeze frame of the federal budget where uh, the fiscal year is about to end uh, at the end of this week, September 30th, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, here's where we look like we're going to uh, end up with about a trillion, $1.3 trillion deficit again this year, about the same as last year. So again, if you want to look at the good news, <laughs> it's not any worse. Uh, the interesting thing to notice about there, so one thing that, that we'll come back uh, and talk about more later is the red bar on the top of the spending column, which is the interest. That's the interest that we pay on the national debt. And uh, it's a little bit hard to read, but it's $221 billion projected for this year. That's, uh, just to put that in perspective, it's more, quite a bit more, than we're spending on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which I think people have a you know, sense of that that's a, a large amount of money. But the interest that we pay on the national debt isn't because of a policy. It's not like you know, Congress says, well, now how much should we pay on, on the national debt this year? That's just a function of how much we borrow and what interest rates are to borrow at. So, it's a variable that's very important to keep track of as, as time goes on. <coughs> a 10-year budget projection. Let's uh, look at where things may be headed just over the, uh, the near term. The red line there, which shows a uh, $10 trillion cumulative deficit over the next 10 years, and roughly you can look at it as trillion-dollar deficits for as far as the eye can see, getting a little bit worse as you get further out. Uh, what that is uh, re representing is a sort of a politically plausible baseline. Now, the more optimistic one is what would happen if Congress just went home and a lot of provisions <laughs> that are going to expire just were allowed to expire. 
and most of them are on the tax side. Uh, the effect of letting the tax cuts that were enacted in 2001, 2002 expire would bring in a lot of revenue to the government, although people would not be happy about paying the higher taxes. So there's obviously a trade-off there. But I'm just saying that uh, that, that would be the effect of uh, not uh, extending those tax cuts. The other uh, policy on the spending side is the uh, provisional law that would cut physician reimbursements for Medicare by some 30% uh, over you know, where they are now. So that's probably not going to happen either because every year Congress turns off that provision. Uh, and so just going back, if you make some politically plausible projections about tax cuts being extended and, and uh, physician reimbursements being uh, extended without being cut, and those aren't wild, I mean, that's not like a worst case scenario, uh, keep in mind. You, that's what produces that trillion dollars deficits for as far as the eye can see. And I think that's really the baseline that you can work off of and say, you know, where are we headed? Now, this is get, gets a little bit geeky here, but it's important to, to look at these numbers in some sort of standard. Uh, ex, you know, if you just look at the dollar figures, it's not as relevant as looking at them uh, as the size of the nation's economy, just like a, you know, a million dollar mortgage may be nothing for Bill Gates, but it's a heck of a lot for me. So uh, just as uh, you know, different nations can afford different amounts of debt. Now, keep in mind uh, that the federal government has tended to spend at about 21% of the economy. That's relative to the nation's uh, produced goods and services. And has tended to tax at around 18.5% of the economy meaning that we tend to run 2.5% budget deficits uh, of relative to the size of the economy. And if the economy is growing at about 25 to 3% a year, that results in a sustainable scenario. Now, people like me might say, I think maybe we should try to do a better job of balancing the budget. But in an economic sense, you could have a sustainable deficit. What's really worrying now, looking off about the future, is not so much the short-term cyclical, economically driven cyclical budget deficit that we have right now. In other words, when the economy is really, really weak, as it's been for the last few years, revenues go through the floor and spending goes through the roof because there's more spending <laughs> for safety net programs, fewer people are working, so less money is coming in. And that's why these lines that have been fairly consistent over 40 years just sort of go in wildly opposite directions here in the last couple of years. But the thing that is you know, troubling is that even if you assume a robust economic recovery is on the horizon in the next few years, we're not going to get back to that nice old 2.5% you know, of GDP uh, standard because of certain parts of the budget which are growing relative to, to the size of, uh, of the economy because of demographics and health care, and because revenues aren't going to keep up with that uh, pace of growth, we've got an underlying structural budget deficit now, which again means when the economy recovers, we're in good shape, and let's say the war costs go back down, of about 45 or 5% of the economy of GDP, and that is not sustainable and that's really the biggest problem that we have right now. Now, that was all a lot to follow, but we'll get, we'll get back to it. I'll go through the other charts a little bit more quickly. What would happen? What are the consequences of some of these structural budget deficits? Well, one is, of course, we run up a huge budget debt. Uh, and uh, that just shows a pretty – now, nobody thinks that, that we're going to get that bad, but uh, it begs the question, what are we going to do to stop it? Another interest, uh, an another consequence of running these big budget deficits is interest on the debt, which uh, is that $221 billion figure that I showed before, but under the plausible budget projections uh, that I talked about with those deficits, uh, interest cost would get up around $900 to a trillion dollars a year just by the end of the decade. So we're not talking about something way off in the future. And by the way, that's more than we're projected to spend on defense at that time. So we have a situation where we're spending more on our debt than we are on national defense. We're also having to borrow more of uh, uh, money from abroad because to finance these deficits. And uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. People are investing here because 
uh, we are considered a safe haven in this troubled time, and so we're having to pay very uh, low interest rates in order to attract this capital. But uh, the point is that we need to attract it. We're becoming addicted to it in a sense, and so when the economy picks up and people start investing their money elsewhere, uh, we're going to have to roll over that debt at much higher interest rates, and the interest cost could be quite substantial. Also, if, if uh, we're putting a, a mortgage on our future national income because attracting all that capital from abroad to invest in this economy means that the benefits of this economy will flow to those who are investing in it. So a couple of things. It just it, it, it makes us more vulnerable to decisions uh, made uh, by people uh, from abroad, and it makes us uh, it imposes a, a burden on a, the future um, economy, or at least a, a mortgage on our future national income. Uh, just an important point is that uh, Congress has less and less control on an annual basis. So this is a harder thing to turn around than may appear to be because more of the budget is in the automatic spending programs like Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, things that are on autopilot that Congress doesn't determine on a year-by-year -year basis like it does with defense and other programs. I'm going to skip uh, some of these just to get to um, some of the, uh, the bigger parts of the budget. 41% uh, of the budget right now is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. My generation, the boomers, are just beginning to retire and qualify for benefits. If you just look out and do a straight line projection and say, budget, uh, we're going to pay all benefits uh, that are projected on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and we're not going to do anything about revenues, and, uh, you know, wh where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with just those three programs plus the growing interest on the budget deficit consuming all of what we think of as a traditional level of revenues around 18.5% of GDP just within 15 years or so. So it, you don't have to look out way off in the future to see a, uh, a, a really uh, tough situation. Medicare is really probably the biggest uh, cost driver in the federal budget over the long term, except for interest costs if we don't do anything about the deficits. But a lot of Medicare, and I think it's um, you know, underappreciated at some point, is paid for out of general revenues. Uh, and that's, so as Medicare begins to need more and more money, uh, it will be more and more of a draw on general revenues because you know, the, the, the premiums only cover 75, uh, only cover 25% of the program cost and the payroll tax for the Part A is already running a deficit. So what we've got here and driving the budget dynamic forward is the aging of the population, more beneficiaries, and those beneficiaries consuming a product, health care, which is rising faster than the economy. So that is why, uh, you know, we look at programs like Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, and think, gee, with this cost growth, they're all, I mean, that's where the growth is projected over the next uh, several years. The rest of government is projected to actually shrink. Uh, and so while we can get savings, and we should get savings from all parts of the budget, including defense, we do have to put the, the major popular entitlement programs on the table, even though they are very, very important, and they've been very successful. So Congress did just pass a, a Budget Control Act. There's a super committee that's working now. We can talk about that in Q&A uh, if you want. It gets rather technical. But uh, let me just skip ahead to the end here because, you know, Dave and I work with people on both sides of the aisle and uh, have been doing so for quite some time. And, and I think there are some general points of agreement. One is that whether you're a Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, uh, current policy is simply unsustainable as a matter of math and not ideology. So w everybody can see that there are going to have to be changes. We're going to have to do things that are not just easy, like cutting waste, fraud, and abuse, or relying on economic growth. Those are both good things, but uh, they're, they're not a magic uh, solution. We are going to have to work together on finding bipartisan cooperation. Uh, it doesn't look like uh, th there's a lot of that going on, but ultimately I think both sides are going to have to come to the table on these things. There has to be public engagement, groups like this. I mean, people have to understand what's going on. These are important programs. Whether you're talking about the major entitlement programs or, or taxes or things that affect every American household. Finally, I just point out that it's really not a numbers issue. The numbers are important, but it's really a moral issue because if we're talking about leaving a future that's unsustainable, what is that saying to younger people? It's saying they have diminished uh, opportunities, a diminished economy, uh, and, and if we're okay with that, what does that say about us? Uh, and if we're not okay with it, 
uh, what are we prepared to do about it? That's the question uh, facing us and the candidates this year. And I'll turn things over to Dave. Thank you. see where this other presentation is. It's good to be back in Iowa. I've had the opportunity to be here a number of times over the years, and obviously you play a particularly important role every four years in the presidential election process. Thank you. And so therefore, you have a disproportionate opportunity and a disproportionate obligation uh, to be able to be informed on issues of importance to the country and to press current and prospective elected officials for what are they going to do about it. Let me just say the issue that we're talking about tonight, which is how do we restore fiscal sanity, how do we put our nation's finances in order, is arguably the number one issue of importance. Because if we don't put our finances in order, then our economy will not stay strong, then our position in the world will decline, that our standard of living will go down, and the domestic tranquility in our streets will ultimately feel it. So if we don't solve this problem, a lot of other problems that people talk about uh, are never going to get solved either. And I'm glad that we've got young people here because basically the truth is three things are going on right now. Your future is being mortgaged at record rates. There are, people are reducing investments in your future. And you're going to face a lot tougher competition. Now here's the good news. We can turn this around. We can learn from history and we can learn from others. And I want to show you a few examples of that and then we'll get into solutions. First, the federal government has grown too big, promised too much, and waited too long to restructure. In 1800, it was 2% of the economy. The world was a different place. Our place in the world was different, but now it's 24% of the economy and it's headed to 37% absent reforms. Spending has been out of control. This is spending per person adjusted for inflation. If it's blue down below, that means the Democrats control the Congress. If it's red, it's Republicans. If it's striped, it means it was split between the House and the Senate. And at the top, you can see which party control the White House. Bottom line, spending is a bipartisan problem. There is not a party of fiscal responsibility. There are people who are, but not parties who are. And the last 10 years have been by far the most fiscally irresponsible in the history of the country. Uh, and we need to get our act together. And if you look at revenues and spending adjusted for inflation since 1914, you'll find that we are spending at 40 to 50 percent higher levels per person than World War II. And we're running deficits of the size that we ran in World War II. And quite frankly, we got something for World War II. We can debate what we're getting for today's deficits. And the truth is, the revenues that we have today uh, are, will only will pay for mandatory spending, Social Security, Medicare, uh, and Medicaid, and other mandatory spending, and interest, uh, and 3% of discretionary spending. Stated differently, we're spending $3.5 billion a day, every day, including weekends, more than we're taking in. Three and a half billion dollars a day. And from George Washington to William Jefferson Clinton, 1789 until September 30th, 2000, we accumulated 5.6 trillion in debt. And since then, it's gone from 5.6 trillion to 14.7. Shocking. And it could go up another 10 plus in the next 10 years if we don't change course. And the real problem is not Today's deficits in debt, it's, what, it's the ice below the water in the iceberg. What you see is today's deficits in debt. What you don't see is what's, as we say in the accounting field, I'm a certified public accountant among other things, what's off balance sheet. The huge unfunded Medicare, Social Security obligations, commitments and contingencies, which are tens of trillions of dollars. And if you added up what we owe and what we've promised, $62 trillion. That's $200,000 per person, $530,000 per household. Median household income in America is $50,000. So that means that under our current status quo do-nothing path, 
the typical American household has a second or third mortgage that they don't know about equal to 10 times their household income, but no house to back that mortgage. And debt per person is over double what it was at World War II. And if you were a family, if the federal government was a family, and median household income is roughly around 50000 so if the federal government was a family and, 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 and operated its finances, it would be making about 951 bucks a week. It would be spending about 1500 bucks a week for a deficit of 525 bucks a week. You can't do that for too long. And how about these other countries that we see in the news? You know, we hear about Greece, and we hear about Italy, and we hear about Spain, and Ireland, and Portugal. Truth is, when you do apples and apples comparisons, we're worse than some of these countries. And we're only three years, less than three years away from where Greece was when they had their debt crisis. Now, we're not Greece, because we're the largest economy on Earth. We're the temporary sole superpower. And we have over 60% of the world's global reserve currency in the US dollar. Plus, we issue debt in our own currency, so we can always print money. That doesn't solve any problems. But we, you know, we, we do have that option. But remember, let's go back to history. Greece is the cradle of democracy. Greece was the greatest civilization on Earth at one point. Greece at one point controlled most of the known world. And now Greece is a mere shadow of itself because it strayed from the principles and values that made it great. And it's got somebody to bail it out. We don't. We have to wake up, recognize that we are following imprudent practices, get a game plan, start implementing a game plan in a way that doesn't undercut economic recovery, in a way that doesn't impede our ability to get unemployment down, but deals with the huge structural deficits that lie ahead before the markets start charging us a lot higher interest. Because for every 1% increase in interest, we pay $150 billion a year. And what do you get for interest, as we say in the South? Shinola, nothing, absolutely nothing. And right now, we're paying historically low interest rates. They will go up. It's only a matter of when. And how do we rank with other countries? Well, based on the methodology that my nonprofit came up with in partnership with Stanford University, we're number 28 out of 34 countries. Australia is number one. Greece is 34. We're in a bad neighborhood. Heck, Mexico's 18. You know, Estonia, which most Americans don't even know is a country, is number three. The good news is, is that Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, uh, and uh, Canada faced fiscal crises in the 90s. They made tough choices. They got their act together, and you know, look where they are now. Plus, if the Congress and the President could agree on some reforms along the lines of Simpson-Bowles, we'd be number eight. We'd go from 28 to eight. I'm, I'm moving ahead. This is revenues per person adjusted for inflation. It's gone up, but not as fast. And by the way, when you study this, not all tax cuts stimulate the economy, and very few tax, tax cuts pay for themselves. We're going to q and We have a progressive tax system. The top 20% of, uh, of the population pay 68% of all taxes. The top one-tenth of 1% 1 pay 11% of all taxes. Is it progressive enough? We can debate it, but here's a problem. When you lift the hood, as Ross Perot would say, and you look underneath, you got some problems with the engine. 51% of tax filers pay zero income taxes. 51%. So you have more people on the wagon than pulling the wagon. Now, those 51% don't vote in the same ratio as the 49% who pay taxes, because believe me, if they do, we're in trouble. When you have a majority of the population that gets something for nothing, and if they vote on the same ratio, you're in trouble. So we have to deal with that. On the other hand, the top 1%, people like Warren Buffett, among others, their median effective income tax rate is 18.8% when the top marginal tax rate is 35. Why is that? Because most of their income is capital gains. It's taxed at 15%. So you can make the top marginal tax rate whatever you want. You're not going to affect them. So we have to address both of those problems. Now, Iowa, congratulations. You're number, you're number six uh, in, out of the 50 states in fiscal responsibility and sustainability. Uh, unfortunately, my state of Connecticut is number 50. We won't spend time on that. <laughs> the truth is, our problem is so big, you cannot grow your way out of the problem. You cannot inflate your way out of the problem. You cannot 
cut your way out of the problem. You cannot tax your way out of the problem. And you have to put everything on the table. We have to reimpose tough budget controls, which is what we had until they expired until 2002, and things went out of control big time starting in 2003. You have to reform Social Security to make it solvent, sustainable, secure, and more savings oriented. Seniors are going to largely be unaffected if they're 60 or over, and young people are going to get a lot more than they think they're going to get. We have an opportunity to exceed the expectation of every generation. We're going to have to be honest that we've overpromised in health care, and we're going to have to have a budget for health care, focus more on preventative wellness and traffic. We're also going to have to get out of the business providing taxpayer subsidies for people who are well off and, and, and voluntarily sign up for Medicare. Defense, we can reduce defense spending and other spending without compromising national security. There's huge waste there. I was on the defense business board for eight years. There's plenty of opportunity. We're going to need to reform our tax system to make it simpler, fairer, more competitive, more equitable, and to generate enough revenues to pay our bills and deliver on the promises we intend to keep. <laughs> we can do that through broadening the base, lowering rates, having a standby consumption tax, and doing a number of other things which I'm happy to answer questions on. <clears throat> and we're going to need some constitutional amendments in all likelihood, like a limit on how much debt as a percentage of the economy we can take on, otherwise known as a credit card limit, because otherwise China will tell us one day what our credit card limit is. Uh, and when you do reforms, you have to have, you have to meet these six tests. It's got to make economic sense. Is it pro-growth? It's got to be socially equitable. We need a sound safety net. It needs to be culturally acceptable. Americans aren't going to support a size government the size of Europe or taxes the level of Europe. It's got to pass a math test. This is the new four-letter word for politicians, math. <laughs> Do you have a plan that the numbers work? Does it stabilize debt to GDP? Does it balance the budget? Whatever your goal is, does it work? Is it politically feasible? Can you pass the House? get 60 votes in the Senate and a presidential signature, and can you get bipartisan support? Because if you pass something on a straight party line vote, like health care, it's not sustainable. It will be overruled, either by the courts or by future political systems. And those of you who are in business or business majors can look at these questions as an example and see these are the kinds of basic questions, management 101, 201, that need to be asked about every major government organization, program, and tax policy, and regulation. They've never been asked and answered since 1789. You don't want to rush into anything, but I think it's been enough time. Uh, and so, in, in summary, we're a great country, arguably the greatest in the history of mankind, but we're not as great as we think we are. And we have lost our way. We have strayed from the principles and values that made us great. We need limited but effective government. We need individual liberty and opportunity. We need fiscal responsibility and intergenerational equity. And we need to start making tough choices soon because we are not exempt from the laws of prudent finance. We can have a debt crisis within this country within the next three years ago. Here's the good news. The American people get it. Their politicians are the lag indicators. Other countries can have done it. If they can do it, we can do it. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Do we have um, microphones available for people to ask questions? Well, while the uh, microphones are coming around and you're thinking about the questions, um, I just wanted to make a comment, and I mentioned this to them when, I was, uh, when we were starting. Uh, when I was in my 30s, um, I started talking about this oncoming crisis. I'm going to turn 65 in two months. I just got my Medicare card, and it is still not solved. So um, it's time. It's time to solve it. So I had, there was a hand right over here. Uh, we have first question over here. First, OK, first question over here. Go ahead. And this is for either speaker. Why do you think uh, something like Simpson-Bowles was not seriously considered or responded to by either party? Well, first, Simpson-Bowles was the president's commission, and the president is the chief executive officer of the United States. So the president really had the responsibility 
to seriously consider those recommendations. Uh, he should have inc included it in his State of the Union message. He should have incorporated elements of it in his budget that he submitted in the beginning of February. He didn't do that. And he didn't really even enter in the fray until April. Uh, and only recently has he really talked with any degree of specificity about what he would propose to do. At the same point in time, when you look on Capitol Hill, the leadership of both parties really weren't enthusiastic about it because that was a grand compromise. That involved changes in entitlement programs, reduced defense and other spending, comprehensive tax reform that would generate more revenues, and the wing nuts, the far right and the far left, didn't like that. Plus, the politicians wanted to be able to have something to go to the people to uh, in 2012 to run on, to be able to talk about how the other people are such bad people because you know, they either want to tax you to death or they want to decimate Social Security and Medicare. And so the answer is they're playing politics. They're playing politics. And what has to happen is the people have to end up holding these people accountable and say, you need to start solving problems. And if you don't start solving problems, you know, we need to get rid of you. Yeah, I largely agree with that. You know, there was a, an effort uh, by a so-called gang of six in the Senate uh, that was a bipartisan group uh, that tried to, the four veteran members of the simpson Bowles Commission that were going back to the Senate that had all voted uh, for this plan, plus Senators Warner and uh, Chambliss, Warner from Virginia, Chambliss from Georgia, uh, who had already been working together. And so this six, they tried to take the, the simpson Bowles framework and, and write legislation with it and get their colleagues interested in it. Uh, and it, it really, the effort was very well intentioned. It, it failed, however, because it had no support from the leadership. And until the uh, leadership comes around to thinking that these problems have to be solved, it is difficult, maybe not impossible, but it's difficult for well-intentioned members uh, to come to some sort of a different arrangement, particularly when, as Dave mentioned, the President of the United States pretty much punted uh, on the panel. Now, why did they do that? I mean, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, you have to look at things you have to be willing to look at uh, health care policy. You have to be looking at, uh, at uh, uh, tax policy in ways that are different, outside the box. That's what the Simpson-Bowles Commission did. Uh, and uh, that sort of thinking is not yet uh, ripe on Capitol Hill, unfortunately. But I, I mean, I think the, the commission report does live on because it had, it had a lot of uh, praise from folks. And uh, this new super committee that's meeting in Congress may consider parts of it. Uh, I, I, I would say that I think keep an eye on it because some of the ideas that they come, came up with I think are ultimately going to be part of a solution, but it may just take another election before we get through it. So um, is there someone over on this side or Pete? Why don't you go ahead, Peter, and then um, you're next. Okay. Um, the uh, Concord Coalition was founded in 1992, and, the, and, and I was looking at this slide, and the next year the Deficit Reduction Act of 1993 is passed. And even though this is a decade with uh, uh, the longest decade of, of, of um, uh, consistent growth in the history of the United States, we actually had slower growth of the federal government in that period than we have for almost any other period that you could look at. Then immediately thereafter, uh, you start seeing this explosion of growth starting in, in 2000 in, in federal expenditure. So I'm, I'm tempted to ask, why did you guys, what did you guys screw up? I mean, you were doing so well, um, which is not fair, but how did what we were doing well before mess up in the last decade? And, and is there a way to, to, to rewrite that? Uh, that whatever it was, an agreement that, that kept us on a sustainable path. Well, success can, uh, can lead to failure in, in, in the sense that uh, there was, I think in 1992, a, a situation relatively comparable to where we are today, except the deficits are much bigger uh, and we're much closer to even bigger deficits. So the, the, the problem is actually worse. But in the 1990s, uh, you know, there was a, a dust up between the president and the Congress. There was a shutdown. But there was a, a real desire on the part of the public to do something about the budget deficits. That was the year Ross Perot got 20 percent of the vote, uh, running largely on budget deficit issues. Uh, Paul Songus had done well in the Democratic primaries. Uh, and so when President Clinton came into office, 
he found that he really had to deal with the budget deficit, and that was his first big initiative. It wasn't what he had campaigned on. He had campaigned on middle class tax cuts and a lot of, you know, other things, but found that he really, his economic advisors and the public wanted a deficit reduction plan. So he put one into effect, and it, it actually did work. Uh, and it did cut spending, and it did raise some revenue, but more of it was on the spending side. Uh, and then in 1995, uh, uh, well, 96, 97, Congress got together with the president and they passed something with bipartisan support that continued to control spending. Uh, and we ended that decade in very good shape, uh, fiscally speaking, uh, even with a very small budget surplus, even if you exclude Social Security. Uh, if you don't exclude Social Security, we had four years of budget surpluses, but I think we had one year with uh, even counting Social Security. So the problem looked, you know, uh, <coughs> like it was solved, and people were asking us, why don't you go out of business? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so what happened was that we started making different choices. Uh, a new administration came in, campaigned on big tax cuts. We had big tax cuts. Uh, you know, I know Dave and, and I both testified before Congress that we shouldn't enact such large tax cuts because we had, uh, these were, you know, projected budget surpluses. They were not money in the bank and we still had the baby boomer retirement coming up. We couldn't rely on peace and prosperity for as far as the eye can see. And boy, we never counted on peace and prosperity turning around as quickly and as dramatically as it did. Uh, so, um, you know, we made some very poor choices in the last decade. We not only cut taxes, we increased spending. Now, some of it is uh, on things like there were emergencies. I mean, the Bush administration sometimes gets a bad rap on spending too much. Let's face <coughs> it, there was the attacks on 9-11, there was Hurricane Katrina, there were some, some legitimate reasons for increasing spending. But the problem was on uh, not paying for any of it. Uh, we, we went to war without raising taxes. The first time in our history we've tried to finance a war by cutting taxes. Uh, and we, we added a prescription drug benefit for Medicare. Didn't uh, add, you know, added trillions of dollars to future liabilities without raising uh, taxes. So I would say that we, uh, we had some bad policy choices and we had some very bad luck because the economy uh, went, went sour and really sour, and so that's why we, we come to where we are today with an even bigger hole to dig out of. When I was Comptroller General of the United States and uh, basically the Chief Auditor and, and Head of the GAO, I remember testifying in the Senate and the House in 2001 about what are we going to do with all these surpluses. And I remember people saying, that we could pay off all the national debt. And they were worried about it. Now, frankly, I didn't worry for a nanosecond about that because I knew these were politicians and there ain't no way in the world that was gonna happen, okay? Well, what happened, quite frankly, is the statutory budget controls that expired in 2002, which had provided fiscal discipline during the period that you talked about, you know, they expired, they weren't extended. And in 2003, just to give you an example, you know, we had another round of tax cuts, even though we were in deficit. We invaded a sovereign nation without declaring war and without paying for it, Iraq. And we passed Medicare prescription drugs, added $8 trillion to new unfunded promises when Medicare was already underfunded, $20 trillion. You know, you know, you know that was, those were three of the most irresponsible acts, you know, in modern history, okay? And it's gotten worse since then. And if you look, in 2000, we were projected to have a surplus of $800 billion in 2000, a surplus of $800 billion in 2010. We had a slight variance. We had a deficit of, you know, trillion three, trillion four, okay? Uh, and two thirds of that was because of spending and tax policy. Only one third of it was because of the economy. So, you know, people, I mean, you know, elected officials are responsible from both parties. You had your hand up over here. Uh, yes, um, my question is, uh, you know, David Stockman has talked about within the Republican Party tax cuts are almost a form of religion, and Grover Norquist has gotten most Republican members of Congress to sign the no new taxes, not now, not ever uh, pledge. You talk about bipartisan solutions, and uh, one of the aspects of that is increased revenues. When you've got a Republican Party that, for this is, as David Stockman puts it, a matter of faith, 
How do you ever get your, how do you see your way to that? Well, first, uh, um, unfortunately, all six of the uh, members on, on, on the uh, joint committee that are Republicans have signed the Americans for Tax Reform pledge, Grover Norquist. But not all is lost. Because when you read the ATR pledge, there's actually two. There's one for the states that basically say no new taxes, okay, or no tax increases. I mean, it's pretty much across the board, all right? That's not what the federal one says. What the federal one says is that you will not increase marginal tax rates and that you will not support re reducing or eliminating deductions, exemptions, credits, and exclusions unless it's coupled with a reduction in marginal tax rates. Therefore, there is a way that you could do comprehensive tax reform that will generate more revenue, as long as you don't violate those two things. Now, the truth is, uh, Grover and ATR would not like to raise more revenues than historically has been the case, 18 point something percent of GDP, but that's not what the pledge says. And the other thing is, is that quite frankly, there ought to be pressure on politicians to rescind and reject all pledges to special interest groups, whether they be on the right or the left. They should have a pledge, you know, they should have an oath to the Constitution and a pledge to the flag, but that's it, okay? And the vows to your spouse, that's it, okay? And, and, and anybody who ends up making these kinds of pledges, whether it's to the left about Social Security and Medicare or to the right about taxes, they're part of the problem they're not part of the solution. Well, in the success on the vows to the spouse ought to give you some, they may go back on a few other things also. That may be a bridge too far. I don't we know. have a question over here. Um, <laughs> could, I, well, I, could I just say something? Sure. Uh, though, on the, I think on the, on the revenue side, one area of potential compromise that was in Bull, Simpson, and the Rivlin Dominici Commission that I served on, uh, we came out in about the same place, uh, which was that if you tried to, we said, let's get around this, this, this uh, idea of, you know, what do we do with the Bush tax cuts? Let's see if we can look at this puzzle differently and, uh, and please both sides. So what we recommended and Bull Simpson recommended was let's look at the exclusions, deductions, credits. Uh, some people just call them loopholes in the tax code that bleed revenues by about a trillion dollars a year things that are actually federal subsidies in disguise. I mean, you can call, they're really spending programs, they just run through the tax code so people can call them tax cuts. Uh, and what if we eliminated those, or at least substantially scaled them back as a, you know, as a point of reference, just as, you know, eliminate them all and then maybe we'll put a few back that we think are socially useful or uh, promote good things. But uh, we found that if you did that, you could raise enough revenue to lower rates. We had just two, 27% as a top rate and 15%. And you could still uh, lower, you could still use some of the new revenue to uh, go for deficit reduction. And that was a deal on our commission that the conservatives, and I think this happened with Bull Simpson also, that the Republicans were able to make. They were able to look at it and say, okay, if we're gonna have a, a more efficient tax system with lower rates, We'll, we'll go for that bargain of using some of it, and we're gonna do spending cuts. We're gonna, you know, it's not like we're doing, trying to do this all on the revenue side. That our, our commission was able to come together on that. So I think that may be an approach, and you know, Dave, uh, I think can work, you know, that the way you can do that and get around this, uh, this Grover and Norquist pledge, or can you just do what Tom Coburn said and said the heck with this stupid pledge? I mean, uh, my pledge is the oath of office. I have a question about um, your opinion of Paul Ryan's suggestion about solving s Social Security. Uh, his recommendation, I think, was that um, he would raise the age limit at which you were entitled to receive Social Security by one month every two years, and eventually this would bring the minimum reception age to 70, about the year 2100 or something. But is that at all a possibility? I don't recall Paul Ryan recommending that, but let me, let me just say this with regard to the issue that you're raising. I think it's absolutely appropriate and likely inevitable that one of the elements of comprehensive Social Security reform will be a prospective raising 
of the normal and the early retirement age gradually over a number of years, for example, two years over about 20 uh, years, all right? Uh, and then an indexing of those eligibility ages to future increases in life expectancy thereafter, all right? I think that combined with providing a somewhat higher level benefit for people near the poverty level and people over 85, providing a somewhat lower level of benefit than the current promise for, for middle and upper income individuals, all right? Uh, and uh, possibly an increase in the taxable wage base cap from, I'd say, 106,800 to about 150,000, but not eliminating it. You do those kinds of things, that program is solvent, sustainable, secure forever, all right? Now, if you do that, by the way, seniors get more than they think they're going to get because they think they're going to get taken advantage of. I could think of other words, but I won't use them right now. Young people are going to get a lot more than they think they're going to get because most of them think they're going to get that word I said before, shinola, nothing, okay? And so here you have an opportunity that everybody gets more than they think they're going to get. So why haven't we done something? Because after all, Social Security is paying out more money than it's taken in. It's negative cash flow. It's now adding for de to deficits. It's $8 trillion underfunded, and it's going to go over up several hundred billion a year, okay, just by doing nothing. And this trust fund they talk about, you can't trust it. It's not funded. You know, I mean, the only thing that's in there is debt, okay? I mean, you can't sell it to anybody. I mean, nobody's going to buy it, okay? And so we, we just have to be honest with people. But it's actually an easy one to do. It's like a layup in basketball. So, you know, let's take it. I think it's, it's, it's really frustrating that we don't deal with Social Security because, as Dave said, it really is the easy one. And the program that he just outlined is one I think you could get bipartisan support for uh, pretty easily. And <coughs> the thing to understand with... with you know, people uh, get the long term and the short term uh, confused sometimes, and uh, sometimes that's deliberate. Uh, when people talk about changes to Social Security, it's not in response to looking at today's budget <coughs> deficit. Uh, you, you, you don't need to cut Social Security to deal with today's budget deficit. What you need to do is make the system uh, sustainable over the long term so that the money coming in the benefits going out are roughly equivalent and that's not the case now so regardless of, of the budget deficit situation you'd want to have some sort of phased in plan of Social Security reform uh, and it, you can do that now because then you, you, you don't want to wait until the last minute it is a retirement program so you do have to plan 75 years in advance so that's the way the reason that it is part of the uh, the short-term debate is not because people want to cut Social Security, so to speak, right now, but to make it part of a long-term sustainability plan. So I have a hand right there, and a hand in the middle here, and a hand here. And a, okay, four people. I think that might be as many as we can handle. Go ahead. I have a question about uh, health care, because this is not just a Medicare and Medicaid problem, but a nationwide problem. The uh, Kaiser Family Foundation yesterday showed that in the last 10 years, health care premiums went up 131%. So do you have some specific uh, plan that you're going to recommend? Because, for example, we've read about the Paul Ryan plan, and that is a consumer-directed skin in the game, you know, pay more, higher deductible type of plan. Um, and unfortunately, that hasn't worked well in the private sector either. So um, what, uh, what specifics do you have? You know, one of the things that happened in the 1990s was a thing called managed care and HMOs, and there was no question the growth of health care costs subsided during that time. Well, uh, the fastest growing cost other than interest for which you get nothing, is health care. And the truth is, the federal government has way over-promised on health care. It's not going to be able to deliver on what it's promised. And we're going to have to go back to the American people, the government is, and to have a discussion about what level of universal health care, I didn't say whether or not we have it, what level of universal health care is appropriate, affordable, and sustainable. That's more preventative wellness, catastrophic protection with options to get more. We're going to have to have a budget for how much we allocate to health care. 
you don't have to go to a defined contribution premium support approach to get there. There are other ways to do it. That's one way to do it, which is what Paul Ryan recommended, but it's not the only way to do it. We're going to have to change our delivery systems uh, to have more integrated care models. We're going to have to uh, also go to more evidence-based medicine and pay more for outcomes rather than activities. We're going to have to reform our malpractice system to say that if you, to have separate courts to deal with malpractice to get out of the jury trial business and to say that if you practice physician in accordance with these, uh, with these evidence-based standards, you have a safe harbor against litigation, which will end up dealing with a lot of the defensive medicine. We're going to have to recognize that not all procedures meaningfully improve and extend life and that you ought to be able to get whatever you want if you're paying for it, but if you want the taxpayers to pay for it, it ought to be something that the physicians say will meaningfully improve or extend life, uh, all right? We're going to have to change our subsidies to get out of the business of subsidizing wealthy people who voluntarily sign up for Medicare B and D. We're going to have to change our tax incentives. Uh, those are just a few things. So the answer is, uh, I mean, you know, you know, we're spending double per person and we're getting below average results. So the idea that you're going to solve this problem without making some dramatic and fundamental reforms along the lines of what I just said is, is insanity. And, and frankly, you can't reduce health care costs by expanding coverage to 32 million more people. It's an oxymoron. Oh, and, that's me, what we, and, that's what, and that's what was done. Uh, let me just, uh, I, I, in the interest of full disclosure, I uh, worked with Dr. Kitchell on a, a com committee last year, com Iowa Committee for Value in Healthcare. Uh, and I think what they should do, Dr. Kitchell, is listen to more of your ideas. Uh, <laughs> because they, they incorporate many of the things that Dave just, just mentioned. I would just add one thing, is that I think in some ways we need to have some sort of, just looking at the federal budget, some sort of uh, budget for uh, health care, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, whatever. Uh, as Dave said, premium support's one way to do it. There would be other ways to do it. I think the, the, and one of the reasons to do it is not just because, it, you know, to pretend that you can put some sort of artificial cap and, and expect to uh, keep that under. I, I think the constraint there is that there are a lot of good ideas for controlling health care costs that are in the president's health care bill, but we don't know whether they're going to succeed or not. And I'm afraid that there, if there's no incentive, there's no, nothing to make them work, that they won't. That if you don't have a, an incentive for cost saving, that even, even the good experiments and pilot projects that are in there, uh, there won't be a, a necessity to plug them into the system. And we've had some good demonstration projects and pilots that have not been adopted be, by the Congress because uh, they didn't see a reason to with their interest groups arguing against them. So I think uh, doing all of the things, we have no guaranteed savings in those things, but if we had some sort of constraint on the overall uh, I think that would help make sure that the savings get there and that you have, the point is not to cut, cut, cut. The point is to have a more uh, efficient, value-driven healthcare system. The gentleman in the light blue shirt has been waiting. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I guess my question is real similar to the last gentleman, specifically regarding Medicare. I mean, it looks like from your charts that that's the big problem, but I don't seem to hear anybody proposing solutions like you guys just were. I mean, some of the Republican candidates are talking about vouchers. Is that is that anywhere along the lines of what you guys are talking about, or is there is it part of the Simpson Bowles plan? Is anybody putting these ideas out there? Is there someone I can well? For? Let me. Uh, I'll take that and try to be brief because I know we're going to get the questions. But um, I was part of a commission, Rivlin Dominici, which met along you know sort of parallel track with the official commission. Um, we did recommend something called premium support, which you could call a voucher system. Uh, it was different, though, in very significant ways than, uh, than what Paul Ryan proposed. And I think it's spoiled the, uh, the, the, you know, muddied the waters on that whole concept of that whole term of premium support, which is really, it's like a defined contribution that the government would uh, make towards Medicare. What we said was, um, as a means of putting this cap on spending, uh, and we did not repeal the uh, Affordable Care Act or any, anything like that. We, for reasons that I was just talking about, thought that the uh, cost-saving mechanisms there should be incorporated. But we said, if we have this premium support model, the, uh, the premium support should rise uh, at a reasonable cost rate. I mean, you can't just 
say, well, it's going to rise no faster than inflation because health care costs is rising much faster than inflation. So that's what Ryan did, is he put an unreasonable <laughs> cap on the uh, premium support. And so that, you know, you look, and the second big, big uh, difference was we kept the Medicare, the traditional Medicare, as an option if that's what you wanted to do. Uh, so, and Ryan did not. So by putting a, I think, a, an overly uh, strict cap that didn't rise fast enough, and by, in effect, phasing out the current term, he scared the heck out of people and made the whole term premium support, something that I think Democrats now say we don't want any part of, but uh, the Democrats I worked with on the Rivlin Dominici Commission, including Alice Rivlin, uh, still think that, that it is a model that can be uh, worked on and has some, has some support. Did you want to say anything about no, that, I'm David? I think Neil was next, and then the gentleman back there. And then I'll have to ask whether Pat will allow us to have more questions. Thank you. 25 years ago, 1986, <laughs> In the second Reagan term, uh, Congress passed one of the most important tax reform bills in recent time, and it did something with capital gains. As you know, we're at 15% now, and 0% since 2008 for the lowest tax brackets. How did this happen, and is there any hope in the Congress for reversing this, because I see this as an important element? The question, I think, is, does a cut in the capital gains rates deliver benefits to the human family? Should we be looking at the same rate on capital transactions as we do on any other income? Well, first, I believe uh, that, again, if you learn from history and you learn from others, you can find a path forward to solve a lot of these problems. And one of the issues of learning from history is the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Because what Ronald Reagan did when there was a split in control is he said, let's broaden the base, let's lower rates, and let's eliminate the differential between ordinary income and capital gains. And I think that's part of the way forward. And in fact, what I, what I advocate is part of comprehensive tax reform uh, is to do that, because what that will do is, if you can get the top marginal tax rate, and I think you can, especially with a standby uh, consumption tax of not more than 5%, if necessary, integrated with the states. If you can get the top marginal tax rate for individuals, corporations and the state tax down to 25 percent, then there is not a powerful argument to say that you need to have a differential. That's low enough and then you tax labor and capital at the same rate. You deal with the Buffett situation, a lot more direct situation, and I think that's the way to go. Did you want to say something? No. Phil, did you? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Walker, I've read enough of your stuff to know and you mentioned it tonight about a potential debt crisis. Would you explain what you mean by that? What, what form would it take, potentially? Right now, we are a temporary safe haven because of concerns about what's going on in Europe, uh, because of the potential of a double-dip recession, high unemployment. And the United States will never not honor its debt for two reasons. Number one, there's something called the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which protects two things but only two things, bondholders of the United States government and military pensioners. Nothing else is protected. Social Security is not protected. Medicare is not protected. Nothing else. But those two things are protected. And secondly, we issue debt in our own currency. We can print money. You know? So, I mean, you know, we're, 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 the question is, what's that money going to be worth? All right? So the real question is, when it, you know, when the economy recovers, not if, when the economy recovers, uh, if we don't start putting our, and if we don't start putting our finances in order in a convincing way, then we're going to have to start paying higher interest rates. And for every 1% higher interest rates, that's $150 billion. All right, so that's going to make this problem much worse. And, uh, and, and so as a result, I think the real risk is uh, that we, we could face a sudden increase in interest rates, as Greece did, as Portugal did, as Spain did, and as Italy is beginning to, and as Ireland did, okay? Because once you pass a tipping point, you know, once you lose confidence, things can, can happen very quickly. And they're not going to go up to the level that they did in Spain. So, but they don't have to go up very much. I mean, for every 1%, 100 basis, 
100, 100 basis points, 150 billion bucks, okay? So I mean, it doesn't have to go up very much. And uh, so I think that's the real risk. So uh, I think people need to understand, we're gonna solve this problem. We're either gonna do it prudently, in installments, before we have a debt crisis, or we're gonna do it quickly and dramatically and potentially in draconian fashions because Washington waited for a crisis to happen. And unfortunately, Washington's a lag indicator and it tends to be a crisis management type institution. And that's why, you know, that's why the people have to rise up and, and have to start demanding solutions and holding people accountable. And that's why the president, whoever it is, whether President Obama gets reelected or whether a Republican gets elected, they have to lead the charge because they're the chief executive officer. And they're the chief executive officer of an entity that quite frankly is in very poor and deteriorating financial condition. There's one other um, aspect to that, and that is that we may, it may be worse not to have a crisis uh, in the sense of a, a benign crisis wouldn't be such a bad thing, one that scared people. Now, I would have thought that what's happened so far would have been enough. Uh, so I'm not sure how far this benign crisis would have to go. But uh, what, what could happen in the alternative to a crisis is a long, slow decline in our national economy and our national standards of living uh, as we just fail to do anything about this and are burdened with a uh, very high debt. Uh, look at the last uh, two lost decades in Japan, for example. Uh, the other thing is you can get in over your head before you realize you're in trouble. Uh, and it's, it, again, it's a certain vulnerability. One of the reasons that Italy is in trouble is not so much their current budget deficit but because they have run up such a high debt as a percentage of their economy that they can't handle a very high budget deficit. And so when hit with a rough economy, uh, investors are beginning to say, gee, they can't pay this because they have such high interest costs already. One more question. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank both of you for coming. Um, we really appreciate it here to uh, hear what you had to say. Uh, my question is along the lines of what you mentioned about the capital gains tax. Coming from a middle class family and not having any desire to depend on the government when I retire, um, my only issue is doesn't capital gains tax, doesn't that end up being a double tax on those who make money? Because in the end, you take your money, what you get after the government takes its share, you go to invest it to try and supplement retirement, and then you get taxed on the gains you make on equities and that type of thing. Don't you think it's more fair if we were maybe taxed on a national sales <laughs> tax where it's based on consumption so we can? improve savings rates or at least limit it to only one tax on your income as opposed to adding the capital gains as well? If all we had to worry about is economic efficiency, uh, then eliminating the income tax, eliminating the payroll tax, um, and substituting it with a progressive national consumption tax, maybe like the fair tax or something like that, all right? makes a lot of intellectual sense, all right? However, <clears throat> number one, the fair tax, the numbers that they have behind their proposal don't work, which needs to be fixed, because if your numbers don't work, then people don't want to go any further than that, all right? And secondly, I think that's a bridge too far politically. You know, uh, you know I do think it's possible that you could move in that direction, and I do think that we, you know, that, that even if we do broaden the base and eliminate a lot of deductions, exemptions, credits, and exclusions. There's some that we ought to retain in whole or in part. Uh, one, uh, savings and investment up to reasonable levels, all right, to, for retirement and, 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 and certain things, but we need to lock the money up for retirement rather than having people take it out all early. Secondly, charitable contributions, why? Because the government's gonna have to, is not going to be able to grow as much, so it's going to do less, and that means that charity needs to do more, and you want to encourage people to give it that. And then on the, ho the home mortgage deduction, one house, maximum conforming loan, which varies by region, and nowhere in the country is a million dollars. I mean, you know, as an example. Let's uh, thank our guests for a very interesting conversation. Thank you.